The next one is false converts. And false converts, the next part after that will be false teachers and false prophets. But false converts, Colossians 2, 8, chapter 2, verse 8. Uh, false converts is that wind that's contrary. They go against the Word of God. They go against the major doctrines. They go against the changed life. You know, to, be, to, to you trying to live holy, to, to Jesus said, be holy as I am holy. You're to do your best live a sanctified life the best life you can live according to the Word of God I'm not talking about your best life now where everything's happy and you got everything you want I'm talking about when it comes to sin you are supposed to be struggling with sin you're supposed to be warring that good warfare and part of it's against the flesh the other parts against the lost world the other warfare is against false converts beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. These false converts will use philosophy. The lost world will too, but the biggest ones that are going to hammer you about when it comes to philosophy is false converts. And vain deceit. Okay, vain means fake. Oh, I'm, I'm your friend. Okay. Philosophy. Um, the biggest thing that we fight right now when it comes to philosophy, trying to, that's already infiltrated, the fake Christian movement and it's gotten us true Bible believers to use philosophy terms and not the terms in the Bible is Trinity it's just that's the easiest one to throw out there uh, Trinity is a philosophical t philosophical term it's philosophy essence philosophy okay and they'll spoil you through it all oh, it, it means Trinity means the same thing as the Godhead I mean come on step out of that boat you baby Christians, step out of that boat. All oh, the Trinity means the same thing. It's just, it's the same. It's just, you know, step out of that boat. You start doing the study, you realize Godhead is not just a description, it's a title for God. Capital G, Godhead, is a title for God. You start doing the study and you're like, wait a minute, they're not the same. Wait a minute, they're trying to replace a title for God with a philosophical title? Uh, that comes from the Catholic Church. Uh, this is very wicked and very wrong. But when you're a baby, these people will use philosophy to get you to step out of that boat. They want you to sink. Step out of that boat. And when you step out of the boat, in the second scenario that we're talking about where you want to do more for the Lord, and the Lord's like, step out of that boat, they're going to hit you twice as hard. They're going to try to deceive you. They're going to use words that aren't found in the Bible to try to deceive you, to twist things. The moment, the moment you take words that are in the Bible and you try to replace them with other words, they can get you. And it's been proven time and time again. The Great Tribulation, they try to use that as a title, and it's not a title in the Bible. And when a lot of, uh, I believe, saved uh, brothers and sisters in Christ used that title, that gave them, leg they gave them an end to fight you. Because when you say the Great Tribulation, they can say, see here in the Bible it says that Christians will have tribulation. See here it says Christ Christians will have tribulation. See that. And is that true in the Bible? Absolutely. But when you start growing in the Lord, you're like, you know what? I was deceived by that philosophy. I was deceived by that vain deceit. I was The next part, after the traditions of men. I was deceived by the tradition of men, and I was using the Great Tribulation as a title, and it's not a title. You study the Bible, you realize the title is the, is the time of Jacob's trouble is the title for that seven-year period. And when you use the proper title for that seven-year period, they have no legroom. Okay, the time of Jacob's trouble, it's not about us having tribulations today and them having tribulations in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's about God focusing his back on the Jewish people. Jacob is another word for Israel. And when you use the proper title, it shuts them down. They'll start going crazy on you. So, traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So we're talking about the Trinity. Now, traditions of men and rudiments of the world. My book tour that I'll do. Luther's works, introduction to the, I always have a hard time pronouncing that word, Edgetical, I can't even pronounce it. I have to look it up where it shows you how to pronounce it. Writings. It's not ecumenical, it's ec. ec I can't do it. Writings. Anyway, 
Martin Luther, okay, I believe, and it's not like I can't be 100%, but I do believe that part of the reason why the word Trinity and the terms of the Trinity came into Bible-believing movement is people like Martin Luther. He found out that the Catholic Church was lying to them. They, got, they wanted the Word of God in their hands. The indulgences were a lie. He, that's where he did his uh, 97 the, something thesis he nailed to the church door when they were trying to do indulgences, and the Bible says it's faith. So, so Luther wanted to obey the Bible, and he wanted, to, you know, he wanted the Word of God in his hands. But his mistake was he wanted to reform the Catholic Church. He didn't want to get away from it, period. That was his mistake. And because he didn't want to get away with it, from it, period, I believe it was people like him that brought in the Catholic terms into the Bible-believing movement. The word cat, uh, Trinity, uh, God in three persons, it's not in the Bible. Uh, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Okay? Not in the Bible. Those are terms from the Catholic Church. They're false gods. When you say God the Son, you're, it's, a, it's an antichrist. Because there's only one capital G God, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. One capital G God, the Father. There's only one God, the Father. Thou believest there's one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. One God. So, I believe that you have people that they'll hold on to traditions of men. Oh, the church fathers always use the word Trinity. And you go back and you listen to them talk, and most of the time, actually, I right here in my hand. Most of the time, what people believe is the Godhead. Bible believing Christians. You start talking to them, the real ones, and you start talking to them, and they're like, well, yeah, I don't believe there's three separate gods that make up one God. And, you know, I, three, I believe in the body. You have body, soul, and spirit. Jesus is the body, God's. The Father is the soul, and the Holy Ghost is the spirit. I mean, that's what I believe, but they were using the term Trinity, and they were using the term God in three persons, and they were using the term God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the Father. And you, you hit them up with this, and they're like, you know what? That's, that's not right. I shouldn't be doing that. But you'll have people that will use the traditions of men to get you to take your eyes off Jesus. It's no longer, thus saith the Lord, or what does the Bible say, it's what does men say. Men have always used the word rapture. It's a widely accepted term among the body of Christ. The church fathers loved it. Well, you know what? I will stand and stand and stand to tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, that the mo I think the whole plan and purpose of people straying from words in the Bible was Satan's way of getting you away from the Word of God. Step out of that boat. It starts small. Like I told you, true deception is not something that happens overnight. Night. Someone who's truly trying to deceive you is not something that happens overnight. It's something that happens over time. So it starts out with, we only use terms that are in the Bible. Then it gets to the point where, hey, let's, let's throw rapture in. The Bible word is caught up. But let's throw rapture in. It's not in the Bible, but you know, it kind of means the same thing. It starts out with the little things to, try, to draw you away from the Word of God. And it went from little things that seemed harmless to now they're replacing a title for God with Trinity. That's how bad it's gotten, but it didn't happen overnight. Okay. You want to you know an easy way to get your eyes taken off Jesus Christ? Fall into the trap of this world of adding word or using phrases and words that aren't found in scripture adding to the word and subtracting from the word the traditions of men falling into philosophy falling into the rudiments of the world this is the way we've always done things it's not about what the bible says it's about what man says and not after christ people of the trinity they're not worshiping jesus christ they're worshiping satan uh, the people of post-trib mid-trib they're not worshiping Jesus Christ. They're worshiping Satan. And I could go on and on and on. Not after Christ. One of the big things, and I have to throw this out there, one of the big things, and it goes back to, I know it's going to be a long video, but I'll break it down. It's going to go back to these two. Okay? 
I get attacked, uh, one of the attacks that I get is, one of them was rapture wasn't in the Bible, and people uh, accept it, and I said, but caught up is. Why don't we say caught up? Uh, people, some people call it the rapture, but the Bible says caught up. It's the catching away of the body of Christ. It's the Godhead. You know, but one of the attacks they'll hit me with is the word Bible's not in the Bible. King James Version Bible isn't in the Bible. And this is what you can throw back in their face. With love, they okay, don't be like them. Here's the thing. If all we had was one book, the King James Bible, we only had one book, the true word of God, the Texas Receptus that comes in English that comes from uh, Antioch, we could say the word of God says. Now I'm not saying you can't, but I'm saying why do we say King James Bible? This is why, right here. Over 300 Bible perversions out there. So when we say the Bible says or the word says, like we say the word says, how is the lost world fake Christians and real Christians that are struggling to find truth, God's bringing them into all truth, how are they supposed to know what Bible or what word of God we're talking about? There's so many fakes and frauds out there. Why do we say the King James Bible? God's perfect written word, we shouldn't have to say that all the time, but every once in a while you'll hear me say God's perfect written word, the King James Bible. Word of God is in the Bible. But this is a non-argument. Why? Because they're trying to pull you away from God. They're trying to take your eyes off the Lord to get you to step out of the boat. The, the baby Christians, step out of the boat. It's not a big deal. You can get away from that Bible. You can get used to words that aren't found in the Bible. It's no big deal. That's all it's about. If this was the only book, the only Bible for the English-speaking people in English, I could say all the time, I could say, the Word of God says this, the Word of God says that, and everybody that speaks English would know what I'm talking about. One book, one standard. But we don't have that today. We have over so many perversions that you have to say King James Bible. That's a non-argument. That's just them desperate to justify using terms that aren't in the Bible. I say the Word of God. We talk about the Word of God. It's in the Bible. Lowercase w is the written Word of God. Capital W is the manifest Word of God. We use terms that are in the Bible. We don't add to it. We don't say, well, the King James Bible is in the Bible. We don't say that. We say the Word of God. And where do you find the Word of God in English? King James Bible. They can't handle it? Tough. But don't let them get your eyes off Jesus by adding to the Word of God and subtracting, getting you to add to the Word of God and subtract from the Word of God. When I realized I was using terms that weren't in the Bible, God convicted me, and I'm doing my best to get those terms out. I still slip up. It's a struggle. But cause false converts, one of the biggest things they're going to do is they're going to try to get your eyes off the Word of God. That's one of the biggest things they do. Uh, they'll make a mess of scripture, they'll twist, twist scripture, and they'll get you to turn your back on the true gospel, they'll get you to turn your back on the pre time of Jacob's trouble, they'll even people will give you to turn your back on the King James Bible. Okay, 1 Corinthians 2.6 and James 1.5. So 1 Corinthians 2.6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Once again, they'll try to use worldly wisdom. They'll get you away from the Word of God and try to get you with worldly wisdom. Well, yeah, it's not really there, but, you know, Confucius says, I just, it's just frustrating, brothers and sisters in Christ, that I, Facebook and other people's, and it's like, there was, a, uh, there was a woman that I knew in high school, and she kept quoting um, from Bible perversions, so I'd quote uh, King James Bibles in the comments section to show her that they're different. They teach two different things, that she's got a Bible perversion. I'd link the Bible perversion issue to let her go to things, and after a while, she dropped me. And I'm not offended by that at all. I stood for the Word of God. I wasn't mean. I wasn't disrespectful. 
I would just link the King James Bible version to whatever verse she did to show that it was different. Now, I have a little bit more respect, even though she's lost, for her, because most of her stuff was Bible verses, even though they come from a perversion. But there's a lot of people out there that are, Bible, that are supposed to be Bible-believing, God-fearing, and I believe they are, that, and you out there, that when you look at their pictures and the phrases they throw up, it's words of men. It's philosophical, and it's words of men. It's not the words of God. And I'm like, uh, why, don't you, why aren't you using the word of God? Okay. Why are you using the word of men and philosophical and, you know, why aren't you using the word of God? Well, that's because it's one of the plans, is to get your eyes off the word of God to baby Christians, get out of the boat, get out of the word of God, and it takes your eyes off Jesus. So, they'll use the wisdom of this world. Okay. You know, traditions that goes back to traditions of men, philosophy. Um, they'll also pull sometimes uh, PhD, THT, doctorates, masters, you know. And it's like they'll always pull that card. And if God didn't give them that wisdom, that means nothing. And all honesty, I still have yet to see one person um, who part of them wasn't messed up because of that because they had a title of THD, PhD, Dr. Dr. Sam Gibb, you know, um, he started having problems, and it's like, if God didn't give you that wisdom, then it's worthless, and you have all these people that will try to shove it in your throat, and we've been talking about people who, the scenario of trying to get baby Christians to step out of the boat, out of the Word of God, but what about those who say, okay, I want to do something for you, Lord. Bid me to come out on the water. I want to do more for you, Lord. When you step out of the water, you're going to have people that have PhDs and THTs and doctorates and baloney degrees, and they're going to start hammering you hard to get you to take your eyes off Jesus and put it on man. Man being the final authority, not God. This is what you do, James 1.5. You want to turn to James 1.5. When you want understanding when it comes to the Word of God, when something's going on, you understand why it's going on, uh, and you want to know, this should be your first response. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. Prayer. Prayer, 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 prayer. Hopefully it's sinking in, brothers and sisters in Christ. That giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Our wisdom is to come from God. Okay, We can learn. God will, through the Holy Spirit, through other men, you can learn from other men. There's nothing wrong with having teachers and mentors. But in the end, your wisdom's got to come from God. Their wisdom came from God. You know what I'm saying? The Holy Spirit and God has helped me teach this. I'm probably still making little mistakes here and there, but hopefully you're realizing that I'm doing this out of love to encourage the brethren to be courageous that it's God that gives us the wisdom. We pray to the Lord, please open the scriptures to me. Why is this happening in my life? Why is this going on? And it's funny because sometimes you'll say, why is this going on in the world? And you go to do your devotions and you open the Bible and the Bible says, that's why it's going on. Why is this going on in my life? You open the Bible. Uh, you're not doing this right, or you're forgetting to do this, and you get convicted, and you're like, okay, that's why it's going on. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God giving you wisdom. So, we talked about the, the THDs and the PhDs that lead to false prophets and false teachers. Okay? The thing today that's so hard, brothers and sisters in Christ, that they're deceiving the baby Christians, getting them to step out of the boat, second scenario, they're really hammering those who have matured in the faith and say, Lord, I want to do more for you and step out of the boat. They really hammer you hard because it's so hard to find a true Bible-believing, God-fearing man that's in ministry, that's teaching the Word of God, standing by the Word of God, only using the Word of God and believing in it. There's so many fakes and frauds out there. Okay? 
And like I said, we'll get into it. So a lot of this seems like negative, like I'm really hammering you and hammering you. This is what's going to pull you away. This is what's going to pull you away. And it is. It's supposed to be like this. We'll get into how to, that God gives you how to overcome and keep your eye on, on Jesus Christ. But 1 John 4, 1, we're going to go there. If we stay in those five things that I'm going to mention later, I guess I can mention them now, we're getting close. Uh, the Holy Spirit, fellowship with the Lord, Holy Spirit, you have to have the Holy Spirit. I throw that in there because it's the number one thing. The Word of God, prayer, preaching the gospel. Okay. Uh, correction and how we live our life and worship. That goes back to how we live our life. So correction, worship, you know, you worship God with how you live your life. It's not just you singing a song. That's not all worship's about, okay? Worship is how you live your life. You trust God, you believe God, and you worship Him. The Bible says that Jesus created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. True worship of God is bringing pleasure pleasure to him, pleasing him. Okay. First John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, two things on the false prophets here that try to pull your eyes off Jesus. And one of them is they'll go against prophecies in the Bible. Okay. Um, there was, uh, there's people that attack the fact they say that uh, Israel becoming a nation, that wasn't Bible prophecy, and it's written in the Bible that one of the prophecies that Israel will become a nation again, and it's now a nation again, it's Bible prophecy, so they'll tell you no. The other prophecy is they get, and you got to, hopefully you can follow me here for a second. You got people that are trying to predict the exact day when Jesus will come back, okay? And. They're not to do that. They call Jesus a liar when Jesus said, No man knoweth the day or the hour. They say, Well, I believe you can. And they call Jesus a liar. And when that day comes and goes, they're false prophets, period. You should never have anything, anything to do with any ministry that tries to predict the day that Jesus Christ comes back. Nothing to do with them. I don't care what their excuse is. Oh, I'm just, tell I'm just teaching what other people teach. Or I'm just letting people know what they're teaching out there. And you know, in the middle of their teaching, it might be true. I mean, it might be, right? It might be, Craig, sounds good. What happened to just showing what other people are teaching and saying it's false because you're not supposed to predict when Jesus comes back? Okay? They're spending their time predicting when Jesus comes back. They're not keeping their eyes on Jesus and the attitude of today. Could he come back today? Lord, is today the day? Lord, am I ready for you to come back today, Lord? Are you ready for Jesus Christ to come back for today? There's days where I'm sitting here saying, Lord, please come back today. I'm ready. And then there's days where I find stuff in my house or I realize I'm struggling with sin and stuff, and I'm like, I don't know if I am ready. Lord, help me to be ready. That attitude, that spiritual walk with the Lord, sanctification, the prayers, everything that I mention, you stay in that every day and you have the attitude that I need to make sure that every day I look up and say is today the day that I have the attitude am I ready today am I trying to be ready for you to come back today when he comes back will we ever be truly ready no why because we don't know when he's coming back but you have these false prophets out there that are trying to predict when he comes back okay you also have false prophets um, the second part of the false prophets do you know uh, brother did a uh, study on this and opened our eyes a lot to it, and I said, and it was very shocking, but very true. Do you know that you, brothers and sisters in Christ, you are prophets? I'm a prophet. You want to know why? Because we have a book that tells the future, future events that are going to happen. But more importantly, we have, are the ministry of reconciliation. We're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. I can walk up to a lost person and say, listen, have you ever lied before? Have you ever stole before? On and on. And prove to them that they're a sinner. And when you do that, you say, I can tell that person, you've sinned against God. 
And unless you repent and believe in Jesus Christ, what he did for you on the cross, you will die in your sins and you will go to hell. That's prophecy. You're prophesying their future if they reject Jesus Christ. If they die in their sins, they will go to hell. We are all prophets, but how many prophets out there, false prophets? Oh, there is no hell. There is no hell. Well, uh, this easy to believe is a crowd. There's no changed life. You don't have to repent. Sin's not a big deal. God will take you in. You can still be a wicked sinner. You can keep your sin and be saved. It's no big deal. And they're not warning people about hell. They kind of like to take hell out of preaching the gospel, the plan of salvation. Okay, so you got those two people, and what they try to do is they get you, they get you to take your eyes off Jesus. They, Jesus is coming back any day, and I feel, and a lot of us out there, brothers and sisters, we feel like he could come back this year. He could come back today, and our attitude is he could come back today. But when you get someone with the prophecy false convert, a false prophet, say, well, no, 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 he's going to come back next year on this month and this day. Is, is he trying to keep you from looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day? Absolutely. Um, if someone says, oh, the, the Jewish people become a nation, that's not Bible prophecy. Are they trying to keep you from looking and having that assurance of hope that these things are in the Bible, it's coming to pass, that Jesus is coming back any day now? Yeah. They're trying to get your eyes off Jesus. Second Peter 2 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, talking about saved, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. False teachers among you. There are so many false teachers out there that they start out great, or they start out like they're, they're King James Bible believers, and they start out like they're just focused, and they love the Bible, and they love you, and it's, it's all about the body of Christ, and as they go along, you realize, well, they started out to be a pre-time of Jacob's trouble, now they turn their back on it, and they're post-trib. Uh, they believe in eternal security, and there's a difference between, I had a brother in Christ say there was two verses he didn't understand, and in the comment section, there was great fellowship going on saying, okay, this applies to the time of Jacob's trouble, I believe. Or this applies to the, those two verses. This one, we, I believe, applies to the uh, day of the Lord. And they were talking and talking, and it was great fellowship. But people took those two things and attacked the guy and said he was no longer teaching uh, eternal security. That's not what I'm talking about. If someone comes out and says, these two verses, I believe in eternal security, but I don't understand this, that's one thing. But when you've got someone who says, I believe in eternal security, but they're always questioning it all the time. Well, I don't know. This, oh, I don't know. You, well, you, I believe you're sealed, but you know, you start seeing that. First, they're hardcore eternal security. Then after a while, it's like, yeah, you might be able to. I, they have a good argument. I mean, I still believe in eternal security, but they got a good argument. And then next thing you know, he's like, well, there might be some situations where you could lose I mean, there's a lot of situations where you're eternally secure, but there might be certain situations where you can lose your salvation. Okay? They start out doing what they start out teaching, some of them start out teaching right and they fall away. I believe they're saved, they fall away. That's what this is talking about, denying the Lord that bought them. They fall away. And they start teaching damnable heresies. The teachers among you, Bible believing Christians. But a lot of them, they come in pretending to be Bible-believing Christians, and what do they do? They give the people what they want. They appeal to their flesh. They appeal to their, their, their own, I can be the final authority. It's about my feelings and opinions. They give the people what they want. You want hate? I'll give you hate. You want to fight? I'll give you a fight. You know, I'll give you, I'll motivate you to fight. You know, argue, debate. Uh, there's some guy out there that has a ministry like that. That's all it's about. It's just a worthless ministry. Now he claims to be a Bible believer, but he's not. So, you have false teachers and false prophets that will try to get you to take your eyes off of Jesus, that will try to get those baby Christians to step out of the boat. Okay. Last one we're going to hit real quick. 
Satan. Satan and his demons, fallen angels, they will try to whisper in your ear. And I, and I understand, I don't believe that they're attacking people. Like There's some people that say, Satan and his demons are always attacking me. I don't believe that. But I do believe every once in a while they can try to whisper something in your ear to get you to sin, fall into temptation, sin, to pull you away from the Word of God, to get you to take your eyes off the Lord. Because there's times where I'm sitting there talking with the Lord and all of a sudden a thought comes into my head that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. And it's about sin, trying to get me to think of sin, video games, movies, TV shows, whatever your problem was in the past. And you're like, where did that come from? Lord, forgive me. I, I'm trying to focus on you. I have no clue where that came from. Lord, protect me. Lord, help me. I want to stay focused on you. Get that thought out of my head, wherever it came from. Make it stop. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay. Satan is blinding the world. Okay, that's why if you start falling back into the world, you know, conforming to the world, being a friend to the world, it all ties together. Uh, Satan can blind you. You start falling back into the world, Satan can blind you to truth. Notice it says, unless, and this is also talking about the lost people, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image, Jesus is the, the uh, God's person, the image of God, who should shine to them. Uh, the Bible talks about how if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Mm -hmm. Satan uh, will use his false converts, the lost world, to try to preach a false gospel to keep people from getting saved. And what this does to apply to you and me, brothers and sisters of Christ, he tries to get the baby Christians out of the boat to say, well, maybe I, the gospel I was saved on wasn't the real gospel. I mean, it didn't hurt to do those extra things, but maybe it's only belief. Get them to fall away. You step out on the water saying, Lord, I want to be, use more of you. They're, he's going to have his minions. We call them minions, but... The lost world, false converts, they're going to start attacking you twice as hard for the gospel you stand for. The true biblical gospel found in the King James Bible. The word of God, to those who have a problem with us saying the Bible, the King James Bible. The word of God. Okay? Satan does not like the true gospel. Ephesians 6.12, here's the big one, going back to talking about how they try to get you to wrestle and fight and argue and debate people. If you realize you're talking to a lost person, I've said this a million times and I'll continue to say this, if you stop whatever you're talking about and you just preach the gospel to them. You do not cast your pearls before swine. Ephesians 6.12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Someone's preaching a false gospel, you can do a rebuttal video saying this is the true gospel. They're liars, they're serving Satan, they're lost, they're on their way to hell, and this is the true gospel, then you're done. You don't go over there attacking that person physically as far as verbally attacking him physically. He's a sissy. He, he needs to have a suit and tie on. He needs to shave that beard and on and on. That's physical. Our warfare isn't physical. Okay? Our warfare is spiritual. We attack the false teaching, the false doctrine, and then we preach the gospel to that person. And we're done. Okay? There's times I've linked the gospel to mul multiple times to people online but I don't hunt that person down and just keep throwing it out. I rarely make comments anymore. Um, the best thing Brother Brian did, uh, King James Video Ministries, was shutting down the comment section and going to Patreon. I make comments on there. I talk with brothers and sisters in Christ. I get a lot of prayer requests. I get to throw a lot of prayer requests out there. And it's a really great environment to talk with the brothers and sisters in Christ. Whereas before, when his comment section was open, everybody was attacking him personally, and he doesn't need me to defend him, and everybody's attacking the true teachings of the Bible. You just had a lot of people coming on there attacking, and we were spending, I was spending so much time trying to defend the Word of God, which is good, and defend Brian, which he didn't need me to, and I realized I was wasting too much time getting trapped and drawn into debates and arguments and fighting. The best thing that he could have done, okay, remember, you're talking to a lost person, you preach the gospel to them, and you move on. You preach the gospel and they get saved, you don't move on. <laughs> I remember that growing up as a false convert. Oh, you're a Christian now? Next. 
Get out of the way. Get out of the way. We gotta get the next guy. Get out of the way. That's not how it's supposed to be. You lead someone to Christ, you're now supposed to be a mentor. Uh, a teacher, you're supposed to point them in the right direction. Okay, you need to get a King James Bible. Uh, you can get a Strong's Concordance to help. You can do word studies with it. You can look up things in the Bible with it. You need to get a Webster's 1820 Dictionary. The definitions are based off the King James Bible and backed by the King James Bible. Not all words are, but when you're looking up a word that's in the Bible, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, that word, is the definitions are backed by the Bible. Context, context, context. So you give them that, you teach them how to pray, you teach them, because um, you taught them how to read the Word of God, you teach them, you give them some tools to study the Word of God, you point them towards true Bible-believing ministries, you teach them how to pray, you teach them what true worship music is all about, you teach them that, hey, you've been taught the gospel, you now have the minister, you're part of the ministry of reconciliation, you're, when you get the chance and God opens doors and gives you the courage, you need to be, you know, handing out gospel tracts, leaving gospel tracts places, preaching the word, uh, worship. Now you need to worship. You need to worship with your life. Spiritual sacrifices where you're giving up sinful things for the Lord and you're living for the Lord. Not just with words, music, but with the life that you live. What's considered good, good style music as far as it doesn't feed the flesh and what's true worship music that's based off the King James Bible. It's not world philosophy and not meant to get you all emotionally worked up because it's using worldly philosophy as words and not based off the King James Bible. Okay, you don't just leave them hanging. Okay, don't do that. But the thing is, our battle is spiritual. And we tend to forget that because Satan likes to get the battles to be us to be distracted from the spiritual battle and get drawn into the physical. Okay, it's no longer, okay, we start talking about uh, the Godhead, and the next thing you know, we're arguing about whether or not somebody has to wear a suit and tie when they're in front of the camera and teaching and have to be clean shaped. What does that have to do with the Godhead? How, Lord, did I get drawn into this? It went from spiritual to physical. How many of you have, have can testify to this where they start grabbing physical? You know, it just becomes about a physical battle and it's not a spiritual battle. So, remember, Satan. It's, we're, our, we're, phys, we're spiritually attacking Satan by attacking the false converts, saying, you're lost, here's the gospel. Attacking false teachers and prophets by saying, this, what they're teaching is wrong, this is the true teaching. They need to get saved. If you're following this guy, you need to get saved. You need to come to the knowledge of the truth, the Holy Spirit. 1 John 4.3 And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Okay? Antichrist. I've mentioned this before. The Jesus of the Mormons. Jesus of the Mormon book. The Jesus of the Mormons is Satan. Antichrist. He's not the real Jesus. He's a fake Jesus. An antichrist. There's only one true Jesus, and he's found in the King James Bible. The Jesus, the name Jesus that they use in Jehovah's Witness, it's an antichrist. Uh, Catholics, antichrist. Uh, Charismatic, antichrist. Uh, Lutheran, Methodist, antichrist. Um, lately, even the Baptist movement, it's it's like they're worshiping an antichrist because they're not worshiping. They, a lot of them are getting rid of the King James Bible, but even the ones that are using the King James Bible, they're promoting an antichrist. They're, they're, they're in there to deceive you. They're trying to get the baby Christians to step out of the boat. They're trying to get Christians that say, you know what, I want to have more. I want to be more courageous than I already am. Being in the boat is courageous. Being, you know, falling on your knees in repentance, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It takes a lot of courage to do that, to become broken and drop your self-righteousness. But people saying, I want to do more for you, Lord, and they step out there. Okay. The antichrists of this world are just going to start hamming you twice as hard. Okay. Anything to get your eyes off Jesus so you'll start to sink. Anything to get those uh, baby Christians out of the boat, or even, uh, I always said baby, but even a mature Christian, two scenarios, trying to get any Bible-believing, God-fearing man that's in the boat to get him to get away from the Word of God. Anything to get him away from the Word of God to get his eyes off the Lord so he sinks. Anybody who wants to do more in the ministry and steps out on the water, 
tries to get your eyes off of Jesus, so you'll sink. Okay? Stay in the Word. When we're talking about the Word, stay in the boat. When we're talking about wanting to do more for the Lord, and you say, Lord, I want to do more for you, and He calls you out on the water, keep your eyes on Jesus. So, I'm going to stop here for a second, check the battery, and then we're going to go on to the next part, the next half. What can you do to keep your eyes on Jesus? Okay, now we're at the point of encouragement. You understand the things that are going to try to take your eyes off Jesus Christ. The things that are trying to get you to step out of that boat when, the boat, when it comes to the written word of God. Um, the things that are going to try to get you to take your eyes off Jesus and you start to sink. Okay. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2.17. 1 Corinthians 2.17. Encouragement to the brethren to help you to stay, to, to be courageous. I had, sometimes i got to think of the words. To teach you to be courageous. When you get saved, when God saves you and you get in this book, be courageous. Stay in this book. Uh, you want to do more for the ministry and you step out, be courageous. Take that first step. Yes, we're going to stumble. Yes, we're going to fall. Uh, we're going to make mistakes. There's times where we're going to start sinking and God's got to pull us back up. But be courageous. Don't be so scared that you never s step out on the water to do more for the Lord. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 2.12 Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to, to us of God. The first thing that you have to have to stay in the boat when it comes to the scenario of the boat being the Word of God and the scenario of getting out and wanting to do more for the Lord and walk on that water, you need the Holy Spirit. You'll notice that with a lot of these false converts, uh, the lost world can't understand the Word of God because they're lost. But these false converts, they don't like staying in the boat. They like to stray from the boat. They like jumping out on the water and swimming over there and swimming over here and they're up to their neck in, in water. They have no problem with it. Why? Because they don't have the Holy Ghost in them. The number one thing that will help you keep your eyes on Jesus, even if it gets to the point of being chastened, is the Holy Spirit. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Through Christ. Jesus said that I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to, to you. And I'm paraphrasing. Um, I will be in you. The hidden man of the heart. The, Jesus is the Holy Spirit. You have Jesus in you. In you, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The strength comes from the Holy Spirit that's in you, that gives you the courage. Okay, let's go talk to this person about the Lord. Talk, go talk to that person about me. Tell them the gospel. Tell them repentance. Tell them about sin. Talk about sin. Tell them about where he's going to go if he doesn't, if he dies in his sin. You know, he gives you the strength comes down to the Holy Spirit. What, uh, Philipp Philippians 4.13 okay. We just did that one. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. John 4.4 4, Ye are God, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That is a great comforting thought, brothers and sisters of Christ. Greater is he that is in you the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, than he that is in the world, Satan. Okay. What better way to keep your eyes on Jesus than realizing that he's in you, with you, all the time. And yes, it's very convicting too to realize that when you start getting into sin and stuff, Jesus is standing right there looking at you going, what are you doing? What are you doing? He's there with you the whole time. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. 1 John 6.33 These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. The Holy Spirit he brings peace in, in me. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. When you step out on that water... And the scenario that we're talking about when it comes to saying, Lord, I want to do more for you. Use me. I want to do more for you, Lord. And the Lord says, come out on the water. Come on out. 
Um, you're going to have tribulation as a Christian these days. You're going to have some hard times. God knows you are. But be of good cheer as I be not afraid. Jesus talking. He has overcome the world. He has overcome the world. Right? The Holy Spirit that's in you is going to help you keep your eyes on Jesus. Jesus has overcome the world. Okay, you're going to go through hard times, but it's the Holy Spirit in you. And remember, we got other th uh, five, four to five things we're talking about um, to help you keep your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 13:5. This is a very good one, brothers and sisters of Christ. Let your conversations be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. That's very tough for a lot of us sometimes. There's times where I'm sitting here saying, Lord, it'd be nice to do this. I could read the do the deck like this. and I could do that. and I would love to have this. Or I'd love to have... And there's times where I have to stop and say, You know what? What you've given me is all I need. In fact, all I need is your written word, something over my head, the clothes that are on my back, and, you know, two meals a day. We don't even need three meals a day. Some people, they only want one meal a day. You know, we got to, you know, be content with such things that we have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The Holy Spirit in you. Right? You are sealed into the day of redemption. You are eternally secure. When, you, when God saves you and gives you his Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is never going to leave you. Okay? Never. He will never leave thee nor forsake thee. John 15, 9, if the world hate you, you get saved, you get in the boat, you're, you're saved now, the world's going to hate you. But imagine this, the world's going to hate you even more, second scenario, where you say, Lord, use me, I want to be used by you more, and he says, come out on the water, how much more do you think the world's going to hate you when you start putting yourself out there? Okay, John 15, 18, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. In other words, Jesus understands what you're going through. One person, I've heard this so many times, you can't truly understand because you haven't gone through it. You can't truly understand because it's never happened to you. And you know what? Usually that's someone that's frustrated that says that. Because they're not saying it because it's true. They're just saying it because... I don't know, maybe they're fighting you, the, fighting you or something. That they don't, they're trying to seek comfort, but they're struggling with it. But the true statement of that is yes. If I haven't gone through it completely, I will not truly 100% understand what you're going through. I can learn from your mistake, or I can learn from what you're going through. I can say I know a brother in Christ that went through the same thing you went through, and this was the encouragement he gave me. But the only person who's going to truly 100% understand what you're going through as a Christian in this world today is Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit that's in you. Okay? That's why it comes down to prayer. Okay? Talk to the Lord about it. When the, Lord is, when the world is hating you, you're going through hard times, take it to the Lord in prayer. He understands. He understands what you're going through. The Holy Spirit, number one thing needed to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. People who are lost have their eyes on an antichrist. Or the lost world doesn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. The water, the waves in the water, or the world, the wind that's contrary, is false converts. Bugs are out today. Number 17. Oh no, John 14, 16. I almost jumped ahead. John 14, 16 and 17. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now get a hold of that for a second. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he, the Father, God the Father, may abide with you forever. Right there it's talking about God the Father being the Holy Spirit. They're one. But keep reading. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Remember, you can't keep your eyes on Jesus if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. It's not the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. But ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, 
and shall be in you. Verse 18. I will not leave you. This is Jesus talking. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So first, God is the Holy Spirit. God's going to be with you forever, in you forever. Now Jesus is saying it's Him that's going to be in you forever. I will be with you. The Godhead is it living in you. The Holy Spirit is what's in you. Okay? The Godhead is the true title for, uh, for God. It's a title for God. It's the real thing. Don't go for the Trinity. Don't go for the false Trinity. Okay? But here, uh, John 14, 16 through 18 is talking about the Holy Spirit in you. You want to keep your eyes on Jesus? The first thing you need is the Holy Spirit. You need to get saved. We have gotten saved, but the encouragement to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, God saved us, is that we have the Holy Spirit in us. The lost world doesn't. These professing Christians don't. That's how we stay afloat. That's why that no matter what happens, we step out of the boat and we sink to our neck, we're never going to drown. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit. Someone who's lost, who pretends to be in the boat, steps out, they're going to sink like a rock. They're going to drown. Why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them. Uh, people that say, I want to do more for you, Lord, and the Lord says, come step out on the water. And you step out on the water, and there's times where you lose sight of Jesus, and you look to the left or the right, and you start to sink. The most you're going to get to is here. The Holy Spirit's not going to let you sink. Take comfort in that. The chastening will come. God will get you back on the right track. God will pick you back up and get you back on top of the water. Sometimes it's like He picks you up, and we'll find out later, and just puts you back in the boat. And you have to just wait a while until you know, Jesus says, you know what? Okay, now you're ready to try again. So, the Holy Spirit, first way that you need to have it if you want to keep your eyes on Jesus and not sink. You need another way, you have to have the Holy Spirit in you to open up the scriptures to help you stay in the book. You have a love of the truth because uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Spirit will come in and bring you into all truth. So that brings us to the second part. The Holy Spirit, to keep your eyes on Jesus. Two, the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit to start out with. But two, you're commanded to study the Bible and to stay in this book daily. Okay? Study to show thyself approved. Why do I say you need to stay in this book daily? Remember what we read about um, in the beginning here where we're talking about gosh praying alone well watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation the spirit of deed is willing but the flesh is weak why do we need to stay in the Bible daily John 17 17 sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth so we pray to the Lord saying help us with our sin problem the flesh our struggles with sin how the reason we got saved is we realized how bad our life was and how evil and wicked we are. Um, Psalms 119.9 Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Okay. Why do we stay in God's word daily? Because that's how you fight sin. Why do we stay in God's word daily? So we can show, be approved unto God. And that we can know the truth the major doctrines, how we're supposed to live our life, and we're not ashamed. Okay? The Word of God how it goes into how we're going to live our life. How do we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ? The second thing is the Word of God. And the Word of God is going to tell us, the Holy Spirit's going to open the Scriptures to us and tell us how we're supposed to live. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Abstain from all appearance of evil. If you make sure your home is a godly home 
and you abstain from all appearance of evil, you'll find that it, it's a lot easier to fight sin because you'll find out you're staying in the Word of God, you have the Holy Spirit in you, but you won't have as much temptations and struggles. Your home is the one place that you can abstain from all appearance of evil. It's how you're supposed to live your life. And if you're living a life of Christ, a godly life, it's going to be easier for you to keep your eyes on Jesus. If you say, oh, I'm saved now, and you're just going to continue in your wickedness and sin, you won't be able to keep your eyes on Jesus. We talked about this. You fall into sin, it tends to pull you away from the Word of God. It pulls you away from prayer. Okay? While you're dabbling in that sin, or falling into that sin. So abstain from all appearance of evil. Romans 12.2 and be not conformed to this world. We talked about this earlier, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't conform to the world. We told you that that's one of the ways that the world tries to pull you down, but through the Word of God, it can teach you not to conform to this world. The Bible says not to do that. I ain't doing that. The Bible says I'm supposed to do this. I don't care if it's not popular with the world. I'm supposed to dress this way, act this way, I'm supposed to eat these types of food. I'm supposed to eat healthy. Okay? I stand for things that are truth that come from the King James Bible. James 4, uh, back to the being a friendship to the world. The adulterers and adulteresses. Know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend to the world is enemy is friend to the world is the enemy of God. The Bible teaches you that this is how you're supposed to be, and you know what? The world's not going to be your friend. Know that if it hates you, that it hated me first. Talk about Jesus Christ. Okay? The Bible tells you and warns you and gives you a heads up that you're not going to be popular with the world. You're going to stand for the Word of God and you're going to be living differently. And because of that changed life, new creature in Christ Jesus, the world's not going to want to be your friend. But Jesus tells us, and we talked about it, how He understands what you're going for and He lets you know. They, they're going to hate you, but don't worry. They hated me first, before they hated you. He understands what you're going through. Preaching the gospel, because of the perfect written word, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Where do we get the gospel from? God's perfect written word. I've heard people say, well, we don't need the Bible to preach the gospel. Well, where do you get the gospel? From the Bible. Oh, we don't need the Bible to know Jesus. Where do you get the name Jesus from? The, the King James Bible, the perfect written word of God. The word of God. Okay. 2 Corinthians 5.20, what we talked about earlier. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. We are part, we're not just ambassadors for Jesus Christ, but our ministry, we're part of the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? Ephesians 6.20, For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Uh, baby Christians out there that I was at one time, you're going to get to a point in your life where you're going to say, I'm in the boat, that's where I'm supposed to be, the boat's the word of God in one, the one scenario, and I'm always supposed to remain in the boat. But the second scenario that we talked about where we're in the boat because it's our comfort zone and we're learning and we're studying and we're letting God clean up our lives and we're working on prayer and our walk with the Lord and you get to the point of saying, hey, I want to do more for you, Lord. And the Lord says, come out onto the water and you'll learn to speak boldly as you ought to speak. Okay, as an ambassador for Jesus Christ, you will learn to speak boldly. Okay? So, we preach the gospel. What better way, and I keep saying this a lot, all these ways are great, but the best way, the best way, to keep your eyes on Jesus is to talk about Him. What better way is there? Quoting scripture saying, this is Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus did for you. Given testimonies. I know people that do a video testimony. It takes a lot of courage to do a video testimony on YouTube and put yourself out there. It takes a lot of courage. You know, I understand that, and I encourage the brothers and sisters in Christ that have done that. I am proud of you, and 
I'm thankful because a lot of you have great testimonies, but sometimes there's testimonies that are just for a, a Christian in our day, day walk that I've uh, told in the prayer video I did. I'm getting frustrated because all these bugs are <laughs> trying to eat me. Um, where a woman, a sister in Christ, had a great testimony that encouraged me, and I pray that it encouraged the brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? you got to put yourself out there, and eventually you're going to get bold. You're really going to get bold for Jesus Christ. You're going to know enough to make stands for the major doctrines. You're going to know enough to stand for the true Jesus Christ of the Godhead, the true gospel. You're going to have boldness to say, listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, I screwed up. This is where I screwed up. The ver this is what God showed me in the Bible to get me to repent. You don't have to make this mistake, but if you do make this mistake, you need to repent. You can be bold. Not mean, not what some people call a jerk or prideful, but you can be bold. Like, this is absolute truth. Remember one of the biggest things when Jesus was talking um, and teaching the crowd, they looked at him and said that, he speaks as one with authority and not as the scribes. You go, you go from having the attitude of, oh, I don't know, it might be, or it might be, and you start studying. You go to, from that attitude to, thus saith the Lord. This is what God's Word says. Mm -hmm. You can be bold. It's not, yea, hath God said, which is the scribes. You know, a better rendering could be, no, this is God's Word. This is what it says. The next part is correction. Okay, this is uh, uh, this goes on along with how we live. It's a two-parter on that one. So when we don't live right according to the Bible, how does God get us to keep our eyes back on the Lord? He corrects us. We can be corrected by our our conscience can correct us, convict us, and say, "Hey, you remember reading the Bible? It said you're not supposed to do that. The Bible says you do this, and you haven't been doing it lately. When's the last time you prayed? When's the last time you read your Bible?" You, you can get corrected by your conscience. You can get corrected by the Holy Spirit that bears witness with the con your conscience. Uh, you can be corrected by brothers and sisters in Christ. And ultimately, if it gets that far, you'll be corrected by God the Father who will chasten you and physically punish you. Your life will start getting miserable. You'll start going having lots of problems in your life as a Bible-believing Christian. 2 Timothy 4.2 the command, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I mainly wanted to point out uh, instant in season and out of season, but remember, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Okay, we're supposed to correct one another. We're supposed to reprove one another. Make sure each other uh, iron sharpens iron. We're supposed to make sure that we're keeping each other accountable to the word of God. But instant in season, there was a time where this was the word of God, and it still is, King James Bible, and they didn't like that nobody wanted those Bible perversions that the Catholic Church kept putting out. They wanted nothing to do with the early uh, books that now they've changed the name and they're NIV, but those Bibles were there from the very beginning, and they didn't accept them. It was popular, it was in season to be a Bible believing, God fearing Christian man. The true gospel of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess them both in prayer and call upon the name of the Lord. That was in season. But brothers and sisters in Christ, today, it's out of season. But notice it says there that we need to be instant. In season, back then when it was, this was the truth, and it still is today, but it was popular. People were getting saved. Revival was going on. But we're also supposed to be instant out of season. We're still supposed to stand strong for this Word of God, for the true gospel, the Godhead, all the major doctrines, how we live our life. We're still supposed to be instant out of season. Uh, Hebrews 12.6 For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Verse 7, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with a son. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Okay. Chastening of the Lord. God will chasten you to get you back on the right track. 1 Corinthians 11, 
32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. I'm sorry, guys. Blood went down my shirt. I was like, <laughs> chastening. Once again, if all else fails and you're up to your neck, I mean, you can get to your knees and your, and your conscience will say, oh, you're screwing up, and you'll get back down to your feet where you're walking on the water. You can ignore your conscience when you're up to your knees in water, and you get up to your waist, and the Holy Spirit says, uh, uh, you need to stop doing that. Then, brothers and sisters in Christ, their Holy Spirit will bear witness with your Holy Spirit, the Spirit, and say, you know what? It's getting up there now. You need to stop. And if it gets up to here, God will chasten you to get you back up above the water. 2 Corinthians 6, 9. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. Okay. 2 Corinthians 3.16 um, I, I was about to jump ahead. Once again, chastening. I'm just pushing that, pushing that, pushing that, that God will chasten you to get your eyes back on Jesus Christ, to keep you above that water, to keep you in the boat when we use the scenario where the boat is the Word of God. Okay, To keep you above that water when you step out and say, Lord, I want to do more for you, and you start falling into sin. Okay? He'll definitely chasten you if you start putting your face out there and you're living in sin. It's going to affect your videos, your ministry. It's going to affect all that when you're living in wicked, wicked sin. All right? There's a difference between struggling with sin and giving in and saying there's nothing wrong with what you're doing when the Bible says there's something wrong with what you're doing. But 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Um, we learn doctrine from the Word of God. We learned how to reprove people. For correction, that's the big one, because we're talking about correction, and for instruction in righteousness, how we're supposed to live our lives. So correction and instruction in righteousness. We learn from the Word of God how we're supposed to live our lives so we can keep our eyes on Jesus. And then we learn that there's correction. Like we just said, the, your conscience, which is you, you get a chance to correct yourself. The Holy Spirit will come in and correct you. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ will come in and correct you. And if you still ignore all those people, God will chasten you. God will come in and physically correct you. The next part, the last part of all these, okay, to keep your eyes on Jesus, and this is very important one because it blends them. All of them work together. You start failing in any one of these areas, it's going to start affecting all the areas. Okay? Like I said, if you don't start living right, you let sin in, um, you realize, like I said, in a week I haven't prayed. I, when, when you finally repent and get rid of that sin, you turn back to God, you realize, I haven't prayed in a while. I haven't read your word in a while. Uh, if you stop reading the, his God's word, uh, you're going to fall into sin. If you stop praying, you're going to get distracted by the waves and the wind. You're going to be distracted by the world. world. You're going to feel like you're so alone, you're going to start seeking to be a friend of the world, to conform to the world, because you get lonely. You won't get lonely as much as if you have a strong, healthy prayer life. Matthew 6, 5 is where we're going. Prayer, prayer, prayer. In all things, pray. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. I've, I've given up these Babel buildings. Uh, the buildings themselves can be traced back to Catholicism and paganism. Um, we're not to build, uh, well, not all paganism, because uh, the Old Testament, the Jews had the synagogue. But I'm talking about after that, when we're not, the body's the temple. After that, all the buildings that were used after that, um, where Catholic Church starts building buildings and calling them a church. Okay, not synagogue, not these, like, you know, temples. And the, I'm talking about the Catholic Church started building buildings and calling them a church. They build a building and say, that's the church. Not the people, that building is the church. When I got away from the buildings and I started learning, God showed me this. And I'm like, you know what? They did this a lot in those Bible buildings. Um, these big prayer days and prayer ministries, it's all about, you know, being seen of men. Remember we talked about it. 
the majority of your prayer life is going to be between you and the Lord. And that's it. You and the Lord. All your prayer life is supposed to be you and the Lord. Um, you're talking to the Lord. Someone can be there as you're praying, but you got to realize that most of your prayer life should be you alone with the Lord. You and the Lord. And we'll see this. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. Now it's not talking about actually going in the closet, shutting the door. What it's talking about is most of your prayer life is going to, nobody's going to see it. It's just between you and God. Nobody's going to see it. It's just you and God, and that's all it's supposed to see it. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetition as the heathens do. For they think that they shall be heard of their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask it. God wants you to pray. He knows what you need before you even ask it. But He wants you to pray to Him. He wants that personal relationship with you. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. You're to always pray, pray, pray. I always push this, brothers and sisters, and I want to continue to encourage you, encourage you. If you're working around the house cleaning, talk with the Lord as you're cleaning the house. Uh, you're cooking, talk with the Lord. A lot of people like to listen to the Bible, and that's good, like uh, Alexander Scorby. Some people like to listen to Bible teachings, which is good. But when you find out that one of your weak points is you don't pray as often as you do, you need to set that to the side. I'm not saying set the Bible to the side. I'm saying you need to stop listening to those all the time and take some time out just to pray to the Lord. Okay, instead of listening to the Bible today when I'm cleaning, I'm going to talk with the Lord. Because I'm cleaning, Lord, I'm going through this in my life. Um, I'm having struggles with this, Lord. Help me with that. Lord, I really like this, you know. I have some family that are lost, Lord, and help me to have the right words. And spend some time talking with the Lord. You still want to stay in the Word daily. You still want to do studies. I understand that. But there comes a time where you guys say, I could be sitting out here when I sit out here every evening, and I could listen to the Bible being read for two hours. I could listen to Bible studies for two hours. But I sit here and I talk with the Lord. And I say, Lord... This is what's going on, Lord. And I just talk with them. Your prayer life is very important. You need to be praying without ceasing. When I go for drives, there's just times out of the blue I'm driving and I start talking to the Lord. Nobody's in there to hear me, but that's why it's in secret. But I could have the CD and there was some worship music on it playing softly, and then all the, out of the blue, I'll just start talking to the Lord. That's how it's supposed to be. You don't always have to bow your head and close your eyes when you pray. That's only what's called fervent prayer, where you want to block everything out so you can focus on this one subject that's really weighing on your heart and you really want to push it to the Lord. Best example is Jesus when he was sweating blood. Because he's talking about the cross. He knew what he was having to go through and he was fervently praying to the Lord. If it be any other way, take this cup from me, but not my will but yours. Okay, fervent prayers, when you go down and you focus 100% on one thing and you're talking to the Lord about it. But you can still just pray and talk to the Lord about multiple things without bowing, bowing your head and closing your eyes. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 1-2, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Okay. I give thanks for the brethren, the true Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women out there that encourage me, that I learn from. Okay? But also, this is talking about giving thanks. You're supposed to give thanks in all things. When you pray, make sure you're always giving thanks. Throughout the day, something great will happen, and I'll say, Thank you, Lord, thank you. I found something that I lost, or something happened right the first time, or I did something where I could have hurt myself, and that's big with me. God really saves me from hurting myself a lot. And uh, I dropped the knife once and it broke the tip off, but I dropped it down by my feet and it could have went right into my foot. And I just said, thank you, Lord, right out loud. You just say, thank you. You need to be thanking the Lord for everything. Okay. Um, Philippians 4.20, Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Make sure you're giving God the glory for everything. When you say, Lord, thank you, this is you. This isn't me. This is all you. It's still prayer. 
you're giving God glory for everything. Okay. Back to Matthew 14, <laughs> chapter 14, uh, thir verse 31. Now, these five things, see if I can get it back up. Okay, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and through the Word of God you'll learn to, Word of God, uh, you'll learn how to live in correction. Okay? You'll have the gospel. What better way to keep your eye on Jesus than to preach the gospel or talk about Jesus with brothers and sisters in Christ? Not just preaching the gospel, but talking about what Jesus is doing for you in your life. And five, prayer. That will help keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Okay? Verse 31. And uh, Matthew 14, verse 31. Back to the story. And immediately Jesus, remember Paul had the right attitude. Paul, Peter, Peter had the right attitude. Okay? Jesus, save me. Lord, save me. He called Jesus Lord, capital L. Okay? Lord, save me. That's the right attitude to have as a Christian when you fall into uh, struggles and sin. You need to say, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. I, I, I can't do this. Lord, I need your help. I need God's help all the time. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? Jesus stretched forth his hand. Tell me if this sounds familiar. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I, love lifted me. Old hymn, love lifted me. Jesus could have said, hey, you doubted? I'll find somebody else. Oh, you fell flat on your face, brother and sister in Christ? Eh, I'm going to leave you there. I don't care. That's not Jesus. Love lifted me. You struggle with these things. You get to your knees in water. You get to your waist in water. You get up to your neck in water. Love lifted me. God will lift you back up, put you back in the boat, and you try again when God says, okay, you're ready to try again, to step out of the boat and do more for the Lord. Okay, there's times where God's going to pick you up on the water and you're still on the water and He's going to say, keep going. Love will lift you up. God loved you enough to give you to the Holy Spirit, to be with you, to be in you. God loved you enough to give you His perfect written word so you're capable of fighting sin, that you can know absolute truth. Okay? He taught you how to pray. He taught you how to live your life. He loves you enough to do that, to correct you, okay? He wants a prayer life. He wants a personal relationship with you. He loves you. Love lifted me. When you struggle with this world and you take your eyes off Jesus Christ, we know in our hearts that what we did was wrong. We feel like dirt. When we fall into sin and temptation, we feel awful. I feel so awful. I just feel like miserable. But you know what? When we repent and turn back to God, God's love will lift us back up. He'll put us back on the right path and say, okay, let's, let's uh, start where we finished off. Let's continue where we finished off at when, before you fell. Let's continue our walk together. Okay? Love will lift you up. Verse 32 and 33, And when they came into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Notice there when it says, When they came into the ship, the wind ceased. When you, the wind, the false converts are hammering you, there's times where you guys say, I'm done with them. I need to spend some time in the world. And the world, I said that wrong. Forgive me, Lord. The Word, you need to spend time in the Word and prayer. That's when the wind ceases. You say, Lord, they're hammering me with this. Let's do Bible studies on this subject that they're, they're false on and they're trying to pull me away from. Lord, let's, let's pray and talk about what they're trying to deceive me with, Lord. And the wind ceases. Okay. When you are in fellowship with the Lord, you stay in His Word, 
and you study it, you live it, you continue praying, uh, the wind tends to cease a lot. They can try to be, con they're always going to be contrary to you, the false converts, but it's easy to put them to the side when you're staying in the Word of God. Like I said, preach the gospel to them. You're lost, here's the gospel. Get saved, then come back to me and we'll talk about doctrine, we'll talk about the Word of God. Okay? First Corinthians 10, I want to leave some verses with you. We're kind of wrapping this up. Courageous man. Peter was courageous to want to step out of the water. Okay? Um, he was foolish to take his eyes off Jesus. He was courageous to say, Lord, save me. Pride, I think, gets to people and keeps people from saying, Lord, save me. I can fix it. I can take care of it. I know what I'm doing. First Corinthians 10.32 whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to glory, to the glory of God. I was talking about giving God all the glory. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy path. When you say, Lord, I want to be, do more for the ministry, he'll say, come on out to the water and he's standing there and you're walking to him. He'll direct your path. You're to come this way. In your life, he'll say, you need to do this. Uh, you don't. I don't want you doing that right now. You're not ready for that. Or I haven't called you to do that. Some people are amazing. I know a sister in Christ that's amazing at having the courage to preach the gospel. She's got way more courage than I do. Okay? I know people that have greater memory than me that can quote scripture better than me. Um, people that have better voices than me. Their musical talent. I used to be very talented with music and I'm not that much anymore it's one of those things where I'd have to really work hard to get back into it but there's some people that just aren't musically inclined and there's some that are there's areas in the ministry one body many members one ministry there's different aspects of the ministry God's going to call you into and say this is what I want you to do and you're going to be like well I want to do that no I want you here uh, maybe in the future but you're not ready for that I want you over here so, brothers and sisters in Christ, let this be encouragement to you. Be courageous. The, Sarah, the um, scenario we had about the boat being the Bible, you want to stay in the boat. You want to stay in the Word of God. Don't let people pull you out of the boat. Okay, you have people saying, if it be, if it be, and getting you to step out of the boat. boat. Remember Peter, if it be you, that me to step out. Well, if it could be that way, you know, maybe the Bible isn't God's perfect written word, and you start to step out of the boat. That was one scenario we were using. The other scenario was that the boat was your comfort zone. Okay, you have, you've studied the word of God for a while, you've prayed a lot, and you're going to continue to pray and study the word, but I'm talking about going from a baby Christian to a mature Christian. Okay, you, God's done a lot in your life to clean up your life. Your home is a godly home. And you get to a point where you're saying, Lord, I want to do more for you, and you say, Lord, bid me to come out on the water. I want to do more for you. Use me for the ministry. I want to, be, I want to play a bigger part in the ministry. And God's going to say, come on out. And we talked about those five things. The Holy Spirit in you keeps you afloat. The Word of God. How you live your life and correction to keep you living your life the right way. Preaching the gospel will keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. And prayer. Those five things will help you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, be courageous. Don't be foolish. And when you, when you do become foolish, be like Peter. Be courageous. Lord, save me. Lord, help me get back on the right track. Lord, forgive me of this sin and help me get it out of my life. Help me to have a changed life. Help me to continue to clean up my life. Help me to pray more. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Don't be too prideful. Thank you for watching.